Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. We are honored to welcome to the show from the rural community of Hanwell, New Brunswick, Councillor Pat Septon. Councillor, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate you having me. So, Pat, let's get the first big question out of the way. And I've asked every single municipal politician, politician, or anyone who's ever come on my show this question. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, um, I, I served in the military uh, for a while. Um, necessity, honestly. Uh, I, 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 when I was... <laughs> When I was in the military, uh, they kept pushing for leadership, leadership, leadership. Eventually, they, uh, I had no interest in leadership whatsoever or being part of any part of leadership. But as with any organization, they're looking to promote from, you know, and, and they pushed me into it. It's like, well, OK, I'll do it, but I'm never going to be a leader. And then the next thing you know, I am. And then the next thing you know, I am. Uh, I ended up where I'm at, actually, uh, uh, because I was in the military. So there's a bunch of towns around us. I was in or Mokdo. I met a girl. Uh, isn't that a typical uh, uh, reason for people to be moving? Uh, I met a girl who wasn't from here either, a Newfoundlander. We ended up uh, meeting, we ended up staying, and we, we, we're here now. Uh, as for uh, being a member of the community uh, or, or taking charge, or, I've always been behind the scenes. I love politics. Like, I love politics. Like, a lot of people out there, West Wing, for instance, would be, I still watch it every week. I'll watch an episode of West Wing. Because I love everything about it. It's the romance. It's how you get things done. And I always like being the Josh, the, the person behind the scenes doing the stuff. Because it was the most fun. Because there's a lot of responsibility in leadership. There's a lot of responsibility putting your name forward. So I always had great respect for them. But I was too cowardly to do it myself. So this is kind of one of those things that I, 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 is where it came from, is watching these fellas do it. And, and that's really where it kind of started. Where did the desire to get involved municipally come from? Because um, when I talk to municipal councillors from across Canada, I, I usually ask them the question, was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up? And if so, was it provincially or was it federal or was it municipal, which is what you got into? For you, where did the sort of inclination to get involved municipally and run municipally come from? Yeah, so municipal was the last thing on my list. Uh, first, uh, Brian Maroney would have been the error of me. And one thing I loved about Brian Maroney is he always talk on the stairs. So we always had a way to get out. So yeah. that that type of strategy I, I, I adored, even as a child. I was, I was in high school, but I still was like, hey, that, there's game there. I like that. So whenever he didn't get the question he wanted, he just turned and burned. So it was that type of process I liked, not necessarily the politics side of it. and didn't necessarily agree everything. Uh, when I, I ended up coming here, and, and and I hate to say this, I always wanted to be a counselor. My wife's first remembrance of me is I wanted to be a counselor. I remember buying a cell phone when they first were able, able to put it on your hip. It was like, you know, I may want to be a counselor. I may even want a cell phone this way. This is how I justify me buying a, a cell phone because it's the most personal, intimate form of, count, uh, of, of government. But I never wanted to do it. I just kind of always wanted to do it. Uh, then I ended up, uh, uh, because I love the organization, of politics, I love the thinking, the strategy, the the uh, uh, how things work. I make a much better right hand than I ever have been a hand. I know that because you can support and prop as a right hand. Um, then I ended up helping somebody who wanted to run for uh, that I knew uh, to work, uh, wanted to run for uh, a provincial uh, level. I jumped in, they won. Uh, I got to love the process of it. I loved meeting people. I loved bringing people forward. And then I got involved in a few more campaigns, as luck would have it. Municipal wasn't really one of them. It was the last list, even though that was the first place I ever wanted to be, really the only place I ever wanted to be. Uh, then I, uh, uh, I ended up helping with the leadership race. And, and I was at the leadership race, and I looked, they invited me. It was kind of, uh, uh, they kind of had the inkling that they weren't going to be winning, but they knew that they had what they needed, but they just needed something. Somebody reached out to me because I owned a marketing and technology company. Uh, and of course, marketing and campaign is pretty helpful. And me having my own company that had did such a thing, uh, you can see how we both kind of used each other. Um, and I sat around the table. I remember um, around all these LMAs, L MLAs, uh, as they are here, uh, stating, oh, my God, yeah, I got this many votes and I got this many votes and I got this many votes. And I remember looking around the room thinking, that, then why am I here? It, it, it sounds like we're winning. <laughs> Everybody lies. Uh, uh, they just don't know they're lying. 
they they honestly believe it. I don't think for a second anybody, but there's got to be some checks and balances behind it. And that's kind of how uh, I kind of got into the organization with that part. Where it got municipal, um, and, and there's a whole circle where we come back to Hanwell, but where it got municipal, uh, I ended up building Get Out to Vote software because, again, it's about the functionality of it. I, I then helped another candidate. And everybody was saying, and I built out an Excel spreadsheets and pieces of paper. And and I look, at, at this time, you go to level Bs. At this time, you go to level As. At this time, you go to level As. Because there's no sense in phoning somebody B. Because I remember every election, every election, my wife and I invariably would get a call. Because I wait till the very last minute for an election. I know people want me to be an early voter. It's not me. I like being in the conversation right up till I vote. I pick my wife up on the way home from uh, work. We go vote. We come back and we have kids. And now I'm getting a call an hour and a half later. Hey, will you come out to vote? Well, that's kind of a wasted part of organization. You just wasted a call on me. I We voted a little bit ago. What are you yeah. Anyway, so that's how I built my software. And that's how I built how to narrow down in the vote. So if you're only five minutes away from a poll. Why phone somebody who's 10 minutes away from a poll? It just it doesn't make any logical sense. So that's how I kind of built my software around. Uh, and, and I've helped a few municipal people get elected. Uh Mayor of Ottawa, Jim Watson, for instance, had my software uh, when he was running and he got elected. I'm not saying my software got him elected, make no mistake. That's like saying, hey, I killed a chicken this morning, the sun's coming up. And if I keep killing chickens in the morning, the sun's going to, I don't mean that. Uh, but it, it helps because it's about organization. And that's really what my favorite part of it was, was organization and structure. So how does, how, does, how, how does someone who likes structure and likes the sort of the organizational go... Okay, I'm going to go from that to actually putting my name on the ballot because I I've I've worked in campaigns, I've worked behind the scenes. I've not been as uh instrumental as you have. Like I've been the door knocker, I've been the phone caller, I've been the guy who basically drives the candidate wherever they go. But when I put my name on the ballot the first time, it was more of a I want people to work for me. I want the <laughs> I want the person to drive me around, not realizing that the people who were helping on those campaigns were not going to help my campaign. So for you, when did that transition happen? When did that moment in that light bulb go off and go, okay, now is the time that Pat's putting his name on the uh, the ballot? Well, that steps back just a little bit back to 2013. Uh, it, it doesn't really, but 2013, we uh, Hanwell wasn't formed yet as a community. So we weren't, uh, we're just in LSD. And I shouldn't say just an LSD. We were an LSD. Uh, but and for, a, for those who don't know, an LSD is a local service development area, right? Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we really don't have control, but we have people who try to influence. Uh, okay. So uh, 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 one of our councils, by the way, we're, a couple of our councils, actually, we're, we're, we're part of this since day one. I mean, trying to influence and, and, and make control, but we really didn't have any say. So uh, I, I was I was approached by... Uh, uh, who turned out to be later a mayor. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I was approached by uh, Council Highslip and her husband, uh, Will Will Highslip, saying, "Pat, will you help us? We want to become a community. Will you help us get out the vote? Because let, let's face it, I'm actually I've done a lot of campaigns. Then even people I knew weren't probably going to win, but I had to be part of it uh, because they were good people. Uh, I tried to support what I thought was reasonable, good people, and I, I just loved the process. Not that I didn't love them, I loved the process. So part of it was this." I organize it. And, and frankly, a lot of communities, the province was trying to push to have councils. They really wanted it. They did. And they were trying to egg every LSD on. Come on, guys, you can do this. Let's go. Go, Charlie Brown. Uh, well, we were one of the few successful people. Because, And I'd like to say not in small part because of our Get Out to Vote campaign. I'd like to think that was a big part of it because I organized from paper to computer to technology to the door to reading and understanding and calling and make sure. And thankfully, we won. We were one of the few people who did it. So my heart was in it. And then like anybody else, like I normally do, great job, guys. See you later. And Peter Michaud was this chair of this at the time. And I said, great job, guys. See you later. Let me know how the community makes it. Um, and I'm living in it. Make no mistake. This is my community. But but uh, we're, we'll see, we're just outside of Fredericton, which is a bigger city, the capital of New Brunswick. And back in the day, everybody just went to town and then came home. And that's, that's kind of our community. So how I got into this, though, was actually much later. I, I really wasn't, hey, guys, you fellas are doing really well. Want a beer? And, and that's all I do. Like most people, not as much involved. And I was, as dialed in, as concerned about little issues here and there, but they're handling it. So we were only officially formed since 2014. We're a novice government. And if you're anybody here's a West Wing fan, you'll, you'll, you'll hear about novice governments and how, you know, they have to be helped. And there's a lot of really cool shows about it, but we're going to screw up left, right, and center. 
that's what every novice government will do because the learnings are coming through. Well, in the grand scheme of things, you're kind of still in your infancy years, right? You're still learning to walk for some sense because uh, there are municipalities that are over 100 years be after being incorporated that are still learning the trials and tribulations of growing as a municipality, as a town, as a city, even as a rural district or a community service area. So for, for an organization that's only incorporated as of 2014, you are literally not even just a novice, you're an infant compared to other municipalities across Canada. Even like literally New Brunswick is one of the founding provinces of confederation. And that says a lot that, there's still municipalities that are still being born 10 years ago. And, and look, literally, we're not 10 years. We didn't, we don't even have a 10-year pin. We don't have 10 years of any. In fact, I, I, when I, and I'm jumping a little ahead and jumping a little behind, but when I first, my first couple of months, six months, seven months, I, I was tearing my hair out because like, what the hell is going on? Why? I know rules. Rules are rules. If, if we're going to go with these rules or that rules, it rules. And, and then I had to stop and I actually wrote an article it wasn't for, we have a magazine we send out once every three months. And I wrote an article, and, and the title of my article was, when we when we started, we didn't even have a stapler. And imagine this government having to figure this out. Our first mayor, our first council, they didn't have a chair. They didn't have anything. So I wrote the article, you know, this is what it is. And then we had a fire department. And they went up against Fredericton and said, no, the balls on these people, rightfully so. They turned out to be completely right, but I wouldn't have been able to sleep for months. So they were making decisions, going stuff, and they had to shoot off the hip. That's that's what new governments kind of have to do. It's like, well, this seems right. Let's go. This seems right. Let's go. This seems right. Let's go. The problem, though, is if, from my humble opinion, I make no mistake, uh, I'm sure if you talk to others, there may be other uh, much better, wiser, smarter, humble, more humble opinions than mine, um, is that we have to start growing up a little bit, too. Uh, because, you know, yeah, we don't have to be... Rome wasn't built in a day. The municipality doesn't have to be built in a day. Um, but how I ended up running and how I ended up going was I got I got I got sued by this municipality. Not sued, but uh, uh, I, I sent a cease and desist letter. It was January 27, 2020. After I helped get this community going. At my door during the height of the pandemic, a knock by a process server from my mayor to cease and desist speaking about the mayor, the community, and its processes on social media. Now, you may think, Pat, you must be one bombastic bugger. No. You took the words out of my mouth there, Pat. No. What it was, and this is where, and it comes down, everything comes down to garbage, doesn't it? Everything comes down to garbage. Let's just play uh, local, politics is local. So what happened was we we're switching a garbage provider. And I'm like, Okay, well, I hate that. So you know those bins, the dolly bins, and you throw your garbage in it. Uh, well, they're switching it so that uh, we couldn't use that anymore. Well, we could use it, but the, everything had to be bagged. To get, everything had to go back to bags because it was a truck that you threw it on. We're, we're 7,500 homes now. We were 4,500 homes in. We just amalgamated with uh, Kingsclear Island View out that way, Ludford. So we, we just grew another 2,500 uh, uh, homes. But then it was just that. So anyway... Uh, the mayor and the community were posting on things. Well, you guys were doing it wrong all along. You guys shouldn't have done it this way. You guys shouldn't have. And, and it was, they were blaming us, the constituents. And I was like, whoa, 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 slow your roll. No, we weren't doing it wrong. We weren't doing it illegal after. So what I did, and, and I actually have everything posted. If you ever want to share the link, I have everything documented, my process here. It's not necessarily great stuff, unfortunately, for, for our government. But my, my response was, whoa, whoa. Your worship, let me let me rate this for you. Guys, I understand this is upsetting. Let's give the new people a chance. Let's give the old people. Uh, let's thank them very much. We know we have a relationship with them. We'll explore this out. Signed a mayor who doesn't blame the constituents. And that's what I wrote. And now, and to be fair, I did embarrass her. Uh, I did embarrass the mayor. But to the point that I was making, they were saying we're breaking the rules, rules all along, but they changed the policy three weeks after I posted that to make sure it matched three weeks earlier, but they served me that I was cease and desist. Imagine a Justin Trudeau came to you, Chris, using government resources and government money and said, if you speak about me ill, or if you speak about our cabinet, our government, our country, if you speak about any of our processes again, you will be sued. Well, that kind of gets to a person. 
I had no interest in running before this point. I, I, I mean, it was there. I always wanted to. From day one, I always wanted to be a counselor. But I also knew the work that was involved. I, I, I'm, I, I, I respected the, hey, I'm glad you're doing it. I just want to chirp you. Let me let me chirp. So and then the next thing was we had the school uh, that was going in, thanks to our LMLA, who was the education minister. Uh, he isn't anymore. He's now uh, he's, in he's, he's independent. Yeah. Uh, but he was there and, uh, he, and he was the education minister and he happened to get us a school. Now, the hardest thing about building a community without a school, because uh, everybody went to town, everybody came home. So the reality is we're starting to see or smell a sense of community. At least I am. Uh, I've always felt like we all always wanted it, but we really didn't want to work at it. Um, so but they put the school across a highway. A highway. There's no homes on it. So imagine this is the school for kids up to grade eight who are 13 years old, who bike. And then across from a highway is where everybody lives. So they have to somehow get across. So I remember asking, who turned out, who was my counselor? I said, so what's your plans of getting kids to the school? And and, and she looked at me, her counselor high slip. She's still a counselor today. Um, still my counselor in my ward. I'm at a large, she's, a, she's the ward part. And she goes, well, you know what? We're talking about the minister of education. And, and he said, if you fools have a plan, let us know. We're looking for community involvement. I said, well, yeah. Somebody's got to step up on this. And I couldn't get an answer. Nobody could tell me. So those were the two reasons I ran uh, for this council, because I felt, felt like there was something broken. Where's the checks and balances and, and threatening to sue a citizen with legal resources of the government? Where's the responsibility of getting the kids to the school safely? And that's why I ran. It so literally was like, OK, there's something wrong. There's things broken. And make no mistake, uh, I understand how uh, forming a government could be. You have to do a lot of things off the hip. But at some point, there's got to be some checks and balances. And that's kind of the, the reason I literally ran. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to yeah, uh, no, and we'll get into that in a few seconds. I will be up front, and I, I, I when I reached out to Pat, uh, he said this is going to be an unconventional conversation that we're about to have, and it's already taking a turn. I, I I've said this numerous times. I, I traditionally don't do research on my guests because I want to learn from my guests because a my listeners and my viewers will not know the information that I've researched, and the conversation is going to go a different way. So I love that you're being upfront about this, and I love that we're going to be diving into this a little bit more. But I want to go. I want to talk about that first election. I want to go back to that first election. That 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 election that you put your name forward. Being someone behind the scenes and then being someone on the ballot are two unique beasts in itself. For you, putting yourself on that ballot, ballot and putting yourself out there, what was that experience like? And for you, did you learn things about the? election process that you didn't have a sort of a mindset around because being again behind the scenes and then putting yourself on the ballot are two different entities for you what did you learn about yourself and what did you learn about the uh election process that you hadn't learned hadn't known about beforehand so i i'd like to say that i ended up being acclaimed yeah but i learned one heck of a pile unfortunately here i am a student of elections like I used to beg people, let me be a scrutineer. I go up to random, but can I be a scrutineer? What's a scrutineer? I, I, I love the, I love seeing the behind the stuff. And even still, I didn't know stuff that I, I didn't know. So for instance, those signatures that you receive, it's like, all right, they they actually check them against the address. I had no clue about stuff like that. I just thought, yeah, all right, son, sure, here you go. Uh, but during that process, this is where uh, I found it interesting about the public. So I was acclaimed, but there were still people running. So I was trying to be a little quiet. Let the people who are running take the space. Uh, then I was getting uh, I was getting notices from people like, hey, Pat, why don't you why aren't you speaking? It's like, well, no, I want the people running so they have space. I'm already going to be running. Whether you like me or not, I'm now acclaimed. But the, yeah. the elections come up with the other 30, let them have the space so they can talk about what they think is going to happen. I also ran into an issue where there was supposed to be an organization of a debate. And I was like, are you coming? And I was like, wait a minute, do you want me to still be at the debate? Because I'm, I'm now acclaimed. I'm not quite sure I'm going to be but then the politics of that, the old mayor versus the mayor that was running and, and watching from that from the inside, you know, I'm going to be here and I have to be a little more uh, 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 super, uh, just a little more discreet. A little, little, I didn't know how to deal with that because I don't know who's going to win, but I got to be on the other end of it. Um, I, I know I may not be anybody's friend right now on council. I shouldn't say anybody's. I, 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 that, that's bad, ill worded. But I may not be everybody's friend on council, but I wanted to make sure I had that option <laughs> that I could be. So then I had to try to deal around that part. What I learned from the election process itself, though, uh, first and foremost, the first day is the most scary thing I've ever went through in my whole entire life. 
and, and I have kids. Uh, I knew the kid was going to show up and I'll be fine. And there's nothing I could do about it now. It's it's the cat's out of the bag nine months ago. This is happening. Uh, but when, when I put my name in, I, I was worried about what was going to do next. When do I put up? How do I do this? And everything I used to warn and tell people I used to help do elections for, I now understood the other side of it, the panic, the relax, calm down. We got this. It, 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 I, I, that's who I needed. <laughs> to relax, calm down. You got this. Um, so... I, I, I now felt, and to anybody whom I helped run before, uh, just know uh, uh, with humility, I, I now understand what you went through versus what I went through. Even just you, putting your name forward, because it's, it's a lot. Did you want to be acclaimed? And I, and I mean that with respect to you, Pat, oh, because I, because I, I hate acclamations and I hate people who get acclaimed. And, and I don't hate the person. I hate the fact that our democracy at the municipal level is so apathetic that people can just put their name on a piece of paper get 10 signatures depending on how much it costs to actually put uh or how many signatures you need and how much money it costs to file the paperwork you literally walk into a, an elected of official position did you kind of wish you had been challenged so that way you could have sparred with the issues that were going on in your community Tested my metal. You're gosh dang right. That's the literal thing I felt robbed from. And make no mistake, I'm 92% sure they're going to try to test my metal after this. But that being said, though, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so much so, I, I, I'm i Shakespearean. My not, my mind and heart are at a mortal war. Um, my mind is saying, well, geez, slow your roll, son. Uh, this is what you want. You want to fix stuff. you got to do it from within. You have things you want to achieve. Well, let's do it. But my heart was like, come on, we can't achieve it unless we get people engaged. We got to talk about it because, frankly, this is where you get people excited about what you want to do. And hopefully you can gather a following. When you're not acclaimed, you're just Pat. Who's Pat? Besides a, a Saturday Night Live skit, Pat's nothing, right? It, it's. But if you had an idea where you were able to walk into so yeah, you're, you're gosh dang right. I was prepared. I, I, I'm a graphic designer, a really, really bad one. Uh, but but I'm marketing. I'm social. I'm, I'm, I'm a guy who kind of had a plan. And uh, I, I was even on, so, hey, guys, you fellas, anybody want to run? You got to run. This is going to be great. You're going to like it. You're going to like it. It's going to be great. I kind of wish we did. Uh, in theory, we were supposed to go to an election again, uh, because when we amalgamated, uh, if you were less than a certain percentage, you had to go to the election again. It was like, hey, I want to go. Let's go. This is going to be great. Uh, even though I was, uh, I was already uh, won, uh, it would have killed our tenure within one year because we just, uh, the province did a big amalgamation. I, I, I applied their uh, what they've done for our province uh, to make a bunch of LSD smaller communities into uh, 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 elected uh, more voice to the people. So I, I do appreciate that. But I do. Yeah, uh, it's one of the things I wish I was able to do so I could test my mettle. And if I had a failed, that's fine. I'm I'm willing to fail. I fail often. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I get it. Um, but I, I, I want to test my ideas so that, hey, is this what we want to do? If we do, let's do it. And it would have gave me more of a mandate as opposed to me trying to build what I was trying to do. Walking into the council chambers for the very first time as an elected official, while you were acclaimed, you still have to wait for the election process to roll out. And you kind of, like you said, sitting on the sidelines while people are jockeying for the uh, next council positions, but you were acclaimed walking into that council chambers to be sworn in for the very first time. Uh, what was that feeling like for yourself? And do you still hold that same feeling in your body every time you walk into that council chambers to ensure that you are making the right decisions, not only for uh, the people, because you are at an at-large district for your area, which is the whole entire community, but for the individuals as well, because as a counselor, you have to look at the balance of the needs of the community versus the needs of the people. Well, you, you're hitting it. So our at this time, now we amalgamated it. Uh, so we have a new uh, uh, change uh, since January, uh, a little bit. So we were four ridings and two uh, at large. Did make a core. Uh, so now, after the new amalgamation, uh, we're, we're now six uh, ridings and uh, two at large, because they couldn't really just fire us at this point, right? It's a, I still think eight people for 7,000, eight councillors for 7,000 people is a lot of councillors. Uh, I made that argument at the very beginning. It's like, at some point, we're going to have to shake a couple of us, uh, mostly us at large people. Um, at least that's my thinking. I don't know what they're going to do at the end of the day. We do not control elections in Brunswick, nor should I pretend we do. So yeah, when I first went in there, 
Now you got to remember, I'm uh, I'm actually barely nervous when I first joined in because this this is the body that sued me, and naively I like the mayor did it. But there's checks and balances. There's mayors can't do anything without something, right? They just can't. So I, they're I'm one confident. vote. They're literally one vote on a council, especially in the uh, the uh, British par uh, parliamentary system that we have for municipalities. They are one vote. They do unless you're in Ontario and you have strong mayor powers. But traditionally, mayors are literally just a figurehead. And make no mistake, every councillor said, "Whoa, I didn't approve that. I didn't want what the heck is this?" But there goes the problem, right? We're going to go back to the beginning. They started and they didn't have a stapler. They were elected. They are now getting a paycheck. They have to find office space. So I, I, I'm trying to forgive the trespasses. Make no mistake here, right? I, I, so when I'm walking in here, it's like, okay, I also know the same staff or the same staff that did this. I also know that this, and it was like, and frankly, I tried to walk in and I'm going to, I'm not going to lie. It was probably one of the most uh, tense rooms I've ever seen. Everybody's on pin, pins and needles. Uh, it, it, it's a cat in a room for rocking chairs. It was very tense, but the last council wasn't necessarily... Uh, how do you say that there was a lot of tension, a lot of tension in the last council. Uh, and, and it was described by everybody too. Emily, there was not once, and I'm not going to get who said what, but everybody had the same conversation. Uh, so I kind of knew what I was walking into, but I'm one of those people that kind of, let's go. What are we doing? Screw it. What's up? <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, I, I do not hold grudges. Uh, it's one of my favorite features about me, but I want to make sure I know where, 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 where the squeaks are, if that's to be said. So, Coming through, so I'm in the first council and it's like, okay, this is great. So how do we do this? And wait a minute, I have to vote on something? I hand to God. Um, that was probably the biggest shock because, wait, it, it West Wing did the same thing where uh, uh, Ainsley Hayes walks in. Wait, that decision happened fast. Yeah, we play with live ammo here. Um, as soon as I walked in, we had to make a decision. Like, geez, I should have had more time to prepare for this I because I have to study. I, not, I'm not saying everybody has to study like I do, but I, I, I'm dyslexic. I have a harder time reading. I have to memorize things, sadly, uh, to some people. Uh, because of that feature, I have to, I memorize things because it's the only way I can get through them. I can't read as much as when you see me reading. You will know I'm reading. It's, it sounds pretty horrible. Um, so I have to study. Going forward, uh, even now, I when we first did our first budget, we were talking about tens of thousands hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And I'm like, yeah, this all sounds great. This is a lot of fun. We do this all the time. This is great. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, what does a million dollars mean to you, Chris? What does $30,000 mean to you? What does 10,000? I know what it means to me and my household and my kids know how many more Barbies we can buy and stuff like that. I get that. Um, but what does 10,000 mean with a half a billion dollar uh, 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 property value? Uh, what does it mean? It means nothing. And then uh, to the mayor's credit and to Councilor Fox's credit, they said, yeah, but how does this affect Mr. and Mrs. Smith? And it brought everything back down to me like a ton of bricks, hammered me hard. Like I'm only talking about two months later. I'm now into the three months later. I've been talking about budgets. It's like, holy crap. Yeah. So and then, of course, I have to know numbers. Uh, it's also who I am, because if you don't get out to vote, it's all about numbers. If you're doing anything about people, it's about numbers. Uh, yeah, it's about feeling. Sure. Uh, but numbers are, are the key. So I went back and, and then I, I made sure I got a test of, I got property values for a whole whack of different people's homes. And so that when I said this, I want to know how it equals this house, that house, that house, that house at various values. So I can know the difference. If we had a $10,000, what does it mean to this big mansion? What does it mean to this home that isn't as, 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 uh, um, as big, if you will? So the weight of it, it still hits me to this day, including some of the reasons I'm still fighting to this day, because it's not about this government, it's about the next. And, and that's what I'm hoping to do at the end of the day. Is, is kind of come up with a, the things I'm doing, I'm hoping makes the next one better, if that makes sense. How do you see yourself as counselor balancing the needs of the few with the needs of the many? Because you, like you just said, you have to look not only just to what's happening now, but you have to look to the next government. You have to look to the next 10 years, the next 20 years, heck, the next 100 years for your community. But there are challenges in your community today. And I can imagine if you go talk to 100 people in Hanwell, they will give you 100 different issues about what they believe is the biggest issue facing their community. How do you balance the needs of the individuals with the needs of the community? Um, so this is where, uh, that Tom Hanks movie where, uh, he's the, uh, uh, man, he's the, uh, uh, congressman from Texas. I, I forget Charlie's Wilson's war. <laughs> war. 
Charlie Wilson's War. That's that's how I uh, 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 this community reminds me of it. It really doesn't want anything. It really doesn't need anything. One of the reasons I moved in here and and uh, 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 council, my council, council high kind of put it best because I didn't know how to articulate it. I was in the city. Uh, I just wanted. To, in our community, look, we have one acre lots to two acre lots to larger lots. Uh, and she kind of put it the best way I, it could ever be phrased. Uh, just want to go to a place where you could pee off your back deck without being anybody's business. Uh, and, and that's kind of what our community kind of is. And, and, and so we just want to be be left alone, just do our thing. Let's not do too much. Like getting the yes vote in our community, I thought was a pretty pretty substantial thing because everybody just wanted to be left alone. But we were, we were trying to say, look, you can get a lot more for your tax dollars. So our issues are actually relatively uh, uh, not... Uh, garbage. It's the same same stuff there. Now, how do I deal with the people that are minority? Who pe I'm just going to say people I don't agree with. I'd like to think I'm supposed to have more information than them, but I want their information. I think everybody should be heard. It is, uh, I've said it before, uh, engaging people is a superpower. It is not a curse. It's a, a matter of fact, if I had 40 protesters in front of me, I'd sit down and talk to them because I get stuff from it. I may not agree with them at the end of the day, but I assure you, I will be Three days later, I'll still be unpacking things. Uh, it, it's how it's how I work and how my mind works. When it comes to it, honestly, uh, we're one of those communities where nobody really. We now have a school, and everyone's like, "Ah, oh, that's nice." <laughs> you know, it's kind of that. It's like, yeah, that's great. Now, there's, there's a there's lot of municipalities across Canada who would be going, "We have a school. <laughs> like, right. we're pulling out the hundred dollar champagne. We're enjoying ourselves for like a good week." I, <laughs> Groups and groups and groups of people, and then all of a sudden, just the mayor quietly announces, "Yep, we're getting to school." Oh, that's nice. Uh, and, and that's kind of you know, this is our community. It's a Charlie Wilson's community. We're really not we're not wanting for anything. We're, and, and look, you hear people. Uh, our children are moving to the bigger cities. Our children who may have mental issues and drug issues and stuff like that. I understand that our families are moving to these these center spots. That we we have to be part of that solution. Is my humble opinion. I'm not saying that's a community's opinion, uh, opinion, but we we have to be part of that solution because our children are, are going these places. But we don't necessarily want a lot. We, we get grumpy with the roads, bumping, but we don't control the roads because it's it's a rural community. Uh, so that's eh, province. School, eh, province, eh, province. So we, we, we unfortunately are, in my humble opinion, I, I think that we, we, we've been taking that road since we, we started because it isn't our community. You know, it, roads we aren't responsible. I'm still trying to find a chair to, to put our council in. I'm trying to find a place to rent. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, trying to road to somebody else's problem. But the, unfortunately, I feel like we've been inheriting those problems. Where I've been told in one of many codes of conduct. So whenever you hear anything I'm saying, just know there's a plethora of code. Of conduct. I, I I've lost count. I literally couldn't tell you how many I have. A lot uh, uh, of code of conducts against me. But uh, one of them is is uh, um, me talking to the community. The, the whole point. <laughs> I, I lost my train of thought there because I was going with something else, and something else just popped in my head. So I apologize. Um, but we really don't want a lot, and. and People don't really care. Uh, they want, the, sorry, the roads. So I think we should be engaging on behalf of our constituents, these issues, that's where I was going, sorry. I think we should be engaging on behalf of our constituents, our counterparts of the province a lot more. That's my personal opinion. I think it's on us. We are the closest form of government. When I have teachers calling me, they're calling me Pat. Hey, Pat, there's, 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 there's a, 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 a petition going on up around the school. Do you know anything about it? Pat, I have this. Pat, they didn't pick up my garbage. Pat, there's this little bag in my garbage. Why is this, this still in my garbage? These are things we get, right? And then, fair enough. That's literally my job. Uh, you're right. Let me check that out. You're right. Why do we buy this? Why do we spend this? Why do we do That's what I'm supposed to be here for is the accountability part. So uh, for uh, our I, I, I hate to interrupt here for a second because – you you bring up something, and I, I I don't know if you're you'd feel comfortable talking about it. And if you don't, please just tell me to go uh, go I'll away for a few minutes. But um, you, you talk about the code of conduct uh, complaints that you have against yourself. And now, for those who are listening across Canada, they may not know your story. They may not know what that's about. 
Um, now you and I have had some off the, off the record conversations behind the scenes, just to get engaged in this conversation that we're having right now. Now, I, I don't want to talk about what you've told me behind the scenes, but I want to, I want to just ask you right on the, the record here, or if you don't, and I'm happy to just cut this out. As I said, I would, um, later on, but if you don't, that's great. Can you explain to my viewers what you meant by you have code of conduct reviews or code of conduct complaints against you? Because someone in Alberta may not understand that or in Ontario what that means. And you don't need to get into the nitty gritty about it, but can you just talk about what you mean by that? Because I think it's an important part of this story because the next question I'm about to ask you goes back to the reason why you got involved in politics and that lawsuit that the mayor brought towards you well i think you literally put the byline to get byline together with that last uh how you tie it back um i don't quite sure we learned a lesson uh so uh i i i, I every time i do this i don't even know you can't make this stuff up uh now look obviously there's two sides to every story uh, i don't yes. want to take away the anxiety other people in this in council have i don't want to take any of this stuff away but I'm going to tell you a story about my wife. My wife worked with a Fortune 500 company. And uh, she used to be called in to go help. Uh, uh, if, if a part of it was struggling, let's say, uh, and they'd say, all right, you go in. Uh, you go fix this part of this company. Now, my wife's a rules person. She's a rules person. Now, to know me is I'm not a rules person. In fact, rules are there to be bent. I'm begging my kids to break a couple because I'm, I'm a fun dad. And, and frankly, that's my job. The best stories of their lives will be say, that starting with don't tell mom. The whole point is, I, I, but I know where to break the rules and how to do it because I want them to know where the guidelines are. But when you're in a government, rules are absolute. They have to be followed. So going to my wife, my wife would go in and start applying rules where there may have been favoritism, there may have been this, there may have been that going through. Now, uh, I've taken political science in university, social psychology university, so I kind of understand the, the, where things go. So when my wife goes in, the first thing she's going to get when, when there's favorites and there's not favorites, and, and there was a lot of bad words thrown at her that made her um, uh, tear up a few times short. Uh, but when she first in, there was a lot of, oh, this is crap, this is stupid, this is bad. But when she left, they were all crying, you can't leave us, this is great, because rules make things fair. Rules make things that you can have in open and transparent debate and then go have a beer. That's what rules are for. It's not personal. This is the argument. This is what my constituents are saying. This is what I think. What say you? And that's the way it should be with good rules is that way. So one of my codes of conduct, and by the way, there's a plethora of them. Uh, I can go into them. And, and, and every one of them, I have a link. You can read them yourself. Um he he does go into them on his YouTube channel, which will be linked in the show notes if you want to go in, because he does talk about them in depth. And I, I had the pleasure to listen to a few of them. Not the pleasure, but I, I, I listened to a few of them before our recording a few days ago. Right. And so it, one of the codes of conduct, just to be frank, is there was a motion on the table supported by two counselors to stop recording council sessions for the public with immediate effect. Now, we just got this. This is one of the things I was hoping for was transparency. I just got this sworn in in March. And now only eight months later, we're not trying, there's a motion going to come out to take out. Anyway, the codes of conduct against me were this was discussed in closed session or, or in camera, I guess is what other uh, parts of the province will do it. Oh, it's a motion. And besides, it, that's only for budgets and, and HR issues. It's not for a motion. I'm not like, I shared it to the public. That was my sin. I shared to the public the motion. I got another code of conduct for sharing to the public the public portion of the public debate of the garbage contract of what was happening. It was recorded September 7th. You could listen to it live. And I, the next day at 2 p.m., I shared it. I got a code of conduct. So the, the thing is, when, they, when and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to understand it Shakespearean style. I, I get there's my mind and heart are out of motor war. I understand. I actually understand where they're coming from. I, I don't want to take this away from them. They were getting shot at the hip. They were making decisions, but they didn't have the public. They were just doing things quiet indoors. That's not the way I want my government to be. I want my government to have everybody outdoors coming in, everybody listening to it. You know what? If I'm an idiot, call me an idiot, and you have every right to. I'm representing you, and if I'm not making the right choices, you find the better person to make those choices. I understand that. That's what it should be. But you have the right to understand how I came to these decisions, and that's what this whole fundamental 
fight, if you will, uh, my Shakespearean battle, uh, is, is, is about that. It's about, uh, I want the public to be more engaged. I want them to be part of something. I want them to be understanding why these issues, I want them to know what's coming up next and where it's going next. Because I may not always be counsel. Right now I'm in the know. Well, arguably, uh, I honestly, I feel like there's things still being kept from me. Uh, but that's the way it was. And that's the way they think it's supposed to be. And I think that it can be better. It can be a, a more perfect union to steal from the U.S. There's there's a way to make this work. Um, where the public can be feel completely engaged. And we're going to get chirped. I understand. The, Do you the, get uh, chirped? Do you get chirped from the residents? Because that was the question I want to ask. Because we go back to when how you got involved and how you sort of chirped the mayor during that at the, the time. Do like, you see? Do you see the comments on social media that you are not not a team player or someone who isn't really got the best interest for the uh, rural community of Hanwell? No, uh, I've never. I got chirped. So uh, one of my first threats, and, and by the way, the plus. The number of code of conducts I got is secondary to the number of threats of code of conducts I got. Uh, <laughs> the first threat of code of conduct I got was in July, one month after I uh, was sworn in. Um, where, all right, guys, I, I went and asked the public, how do you think we should get to school? <laughs> that was one of my first videos. I thought this is what I'd be doing, a monthly video talking to the community, getting the best information. You know, West Wing, uh, politics is fun. What are we doing? Yeah. But I'm also very okay with getting chirped. I have no issues with it. So when I actually said, maybe we could put a pedway over the highway. Maybe there's, a, there's I, I showed three examples where around our community we have underpasses. I mean, then you have to worry about a truck, do you? Just let them go under the ground. Uh, can it build up a water? Yeah, that's an engineer's problem. Not my problem. I'm a politician. Engineers <laughs> got to solve this problem. Um, so I put that out there and, and I got chirped pretty bad by some, but the vast majority, the vast majority were for it. But yeah, you get chirped and then I get to hear the point of view of why. Ah, well, okay, I understand what you're saying, but that's not what it is. I think in every chirp, there's something, right? There, there's something. Do some people just like to see the world burn? Probably. Not necessarily. I mean, there's a reason people chirp. And by the way, I make better friends with my enemies than I've ever done with my friends. Said <laughs> to my friends' uh, credit, I might add. But but I like understanding them. Uh, there's people who chirp me, for instance, now. He just texted me again today. Somebody who, well, I'm going to say this, and people in Alberta may understand the humor of it. Oh, he's just a freaking Trudeau. That's what they called me. Uh, but now, you know, we're texting each other because I had to understand his point of view. Uh, and, and I don't think he meant it in a complimentary way. Uh, but but this is kind of how you build relationships. So you have to understand other people's point of view. And because of it, I'm talking to people now because I get to see why I, I understand. And what's more, he understands what I'm saying. And he understands that I understand what he's saying. And that's the key. Most people feel like they're left out. And that's what creates all this anxiety, this frustration, this this these codes of conduct is people are feeling left out of the conversation. And I think it's a simple solve. Just how get involved in the conversation. How important is it for you to listen to all sides? Because as municipal councillors, you are not supposed to, unless it's different in New Brunswick, you're not supposed to have your mind made up until the vote happens. Now, you can right. go in with biases. You can go in with pre, uh, preconceived notions on how you're going to vote. But you are supposed to be open to all sides. And sometimes you may be swayed by what a fellow councillor says or a public hearing or a delegation says at your council meetings. How important is it for you as councillor when deciding on how you're going to vote, whether it be on a budget issue, whether it be on a uh, small uh, playground upgrade issue, to hear from the people in your echo chamber, which is social media and which is the uh, the uh, people that you follow and your friends that you uh, have coffee with on a regular basis, but also go out to the community and heck, weird concept for some municipal politicians go knock on people's door and say hi i'm your local counselor what what's your opinion on this issue because you're the ones who put me in this position whether it be acclaimed or whether it not be acclaimed um and i want to know from you what you believe is the best path forward i literally do that i literally go out in the middle of nowhere and just talk to random people about random things Good for you Good and point. by the way, it's it's my it's and people don't recognize what I'm doing. They don't even know who the heck I am. Um, but but I want to know it. But more than that, here here's my count. Uh, exactly what you're saying. I believe in in in, in being open minded. Now, arguably, there's people who may not like me on council. Imagine nobody liking me. That's that's just that's just crazy. Um, but imagine uh, 
but that doesn't bother me. I don't, I don't mind. I think you're this way. You're doing it for this reason. I, I believe it's exceptionally important to keep a uh, wide open mind so much so that I got to tell you, I, I, this is one of my fun stories. Councillor Heislip was up the road. Uh, we, I try not to do any debate with any councillor outside this, but I went up to her and I was cocky as anything too. I got you. Because I knew she was against a particular issue and I was like for it. And she goes, oh, I said, oh, I got you. You're going to, you're going to change your mind. And, 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 and it was with streetlights. We didn't talk about it because I wanted to get her on debate. I wanted to use my, my art of influence to win. Not, and she goes, okay, we'll see. And I said, huh, we're going to. And that's how we left it. We didn't talk about why we had no conversations prior. But during the council meeting, I'd be damned. She, in the middle of it, was like, son of a, you win. Your argument's better. I like it. All right. And I was, I, I mean, I was egotistical. I was, I was like, oh, yeah, I got you now. There's no way you're going to, because I knew that she was for this. And I was kind of leaning this way because I, I was thinking. But when she laid her argument, damn, she floored me. It was like, yeah, I never thought of that. And that's a superpower, by the way. It's why I need to talk to people. It's why we should be sharing everything we're doing. Every possible thing we're doing with the public, it doesn't matter how it gets shared, because you'll be surprised what comes from it. And in this case, a counselor changed my mind by following a little bit of logic, applying some facts that I wasn't aware of. And it's like, yeah. So in the middle of me convincing them, I rescinded my, my motion. It's like, yeah, never mind. Uh, this one, that, that, that's right. It's important. Everybody keeps an open mind right up until the, the vote. And that's who I am. Don't get me wrong. I think research is important. And that has to be different than just shooting off the hip. Now, I, I, I told you in our pre-interview that this was going to be 45 minutes long, but we are at the 45 minutes length right now. Do you have another 10 minutes that we can try and um, figure out how to run? Awesome. The trick is stop, right? <laughs> oh, trust me. Uh, I'm usually the king at making people stop talking because I, I, I start asking the stupid questions as my uh, my partner, my husband yeah. would say. So I want to I want to stick on this line of questioning here for a second about the balance. Um how do you balance the life of a municipal politician with the private life? Because I can imagine you want to be engaged. You want to be out there. You want to be in, uh, part of the community, but there's days that you probably just want to be pat. You just want to go grab a, a box of or a carton of milk at the grocery store and come home. How do you balance the, uh, the, the public life of being a counselor? Because you, you, you kind of jokingly said that some people might not know who you are, but there's people who will know who you are. Yeah, there's most certainly people that do know who I am, and I have to show up at the table with them. Uh, whether whether they there, there's sometimes I put myself in the side of a position. Look, I, I put myself out there with these videos that I've been doing, talking about what is happening. Uh, there's a policy, by the way, that is now uh, going to come. They had to publish it, so council can uh, fire uh, a councilor, uh, which just is the most crazy. And I'm going to use the word asinine thing I've ever heard in my whole entire life. But literally, they're going to fight through it, even though the province is coming up with their own. And there's no time to wait. They, they, they have to put this. So frankly, they, they want me to stop uh, trying to, in my opinion, I don't know what the actual argument is. You'll have to talk to anybody else. But trying to speak, stop speaking to the public. To your point, to that very question you're talking about, um, in the military, units survive by getting along. Units survive by cohesion. Units survive uh, by making sure everybody understands everybody's mission and we get it done. And then we get each other's backs. Me posting these videos, me doing the stuff, that's where I'm putting myself out because it's not comfortable uh, for anybody. I imagine people I have to talk about and I try to be as general as I can when I try to speak. Uh, but it can't be good for them. It's definitely not good for me because I realize I'm actually breaking a few eggs in hopes that we make a good cake out of it. Make no mistake that that's that's what I'm trying to achieve out of this. Um, so in those situations, it is exceptionally uncomfortable, uh, especially when I'm in this thing. But I'm also one of those people that I don't carry a grudge. It doesn't bother me any. This is who I am. And if you don't like it, that's the way it's going to be. If I voted for something you weren't for, and again, this this the, the citizen who called me Trudeau, um, he and I, we're, we're still going to trip each other, but we actually now respect where we're coming from. And that's great. The point is, I'm hoping at the end of the day, by by speaking to the public, going out in the public, by the way, sometimes I have to put my head down because I can't truly speak sometimes the way I want to. I can't just say, for instance, even here, I'm, I'm, I'm spar sparing my words. Um, I can't necessarily say everything I need to say, how I say it, and just be blunt. I have to be a little more softer. 
and it's harder. So, and, and this is, please excuse, this is going to be the worst analogy you'll ever hear in your whole entire life and to anybody uh, who's ever suffered uh, family or domestic abuse. I, I recognize this, but that's kind of what I'm going through at the moment where it's like, I, I do the quiet nod, everything's fine, everything's good, you know, we're getting through it. Stuff like that, and that's where it gets awkward for me. Uh, is that is that quiet? No, make no mistake. I don't want to be in that. Uh, I shouldn't be equated to that realm, but there is some similarities in social psychology that do fit that realm. If that makes sense, it does. I want to ask a question that uh, I, I I try to ask a lot of uh, municipal politicians, but I want to preface it this time, and I want to preface it by saying this. The question I'm about to ask is asked to the councillor and only the councillor. This is not a opinion of the entire council. This is not a motion of council. This is his opinion. And I say that because for some some reason, this this question usually gets a lot of emails in my inbox. But (laughs) councillor, in your opinion and your opinion only, what is the biggest issue facing the uh, the community of uh, Hanwell right now? In my opinion, in my opinion only, there's three things, uh, two things truly, uh, openness and transparency. Now, that's my opinion. Now, arguably, other people like we're plenty open and transparent. They can come attend any meeting they want. And that's there's, there's shut-ins. There's people who can't make it to meetings. There's people, uh, I know one person who tried to sit down to a meeting. The chairs were just so uncomfortable he couldn't sit the whole time. Uh, he had to leave. Uh, how how are people like this supposed to be able to get information if we're not as being open and transparent about these things as possible? And by the way, we, we just did pass a, to to a lot of credit uh, to people on our council. Uh, include, remember, I, I got these codes of conduct all started because it was going to be a, a cease and desist of, of recording council sessions for the public. Well, with public help, maybe, uh, with councillors, new councillors that help, now we're recording every committee meeting. That just happened. So there is good things happening from this. But I'd argue there's got to be more. Why did we make the decisions? Tell me how this happened. How do we get this project paid for when it wasn't in the budget? Tell me these things. And this is where I feel as a counselor, I'll feel successful at the end that I can say, yeah, I feel like I know everything. Ergo, you can ask me anything and I should be able to provide you the answer, which comes to the transparency side. There should be no leash on a counselor. So I'm going to challenge you a little bit here for a second, Pat, because I feel like you, you're willing to play in this sandbox for a bit understandable that you want to be transparent with people. And I think this is the crux of what uh, I think a lot of people might be listening to this and thinking, okay, it's understandable that you want to be transparent about how you vote or how things are being done in city hall. But when a motion, particularly here in the West, I'm not sure how it happens in New Brunswick, but when a motion gets passed, whether you're for that motion or against that motion, you have to speak as one unified voice about the future and where they're moving forward. How do you be transparent on a vote where you say, well, I didn't vote for this bill or this motion or this project. It is what the council has decided and we're moving forward with it. Are you talking about that type of transparency where you're willing to challenge what the vote was or what type of transparency are you talking about for yourself to be at city hall? Because I don't know. And I know I might've asked that in a weird way, but I think you've gotten to the point of what, what I'm trying to figure out here is what type of transparency are you looking for where you're able to just go talk about whatever is said at council in any way that matters or where you're able to challenge the final vote that was happened at council. So just as a point of fact, I've never, not once, ever relitigated a single vote yeah. afterwards. I appreciate frankly, you saying that. Yeah. And, and the reason is I'm not the smartest guy in the room. It can't be about me. That's what the whole point of a council is, is the cream is supposed to rise. Everything is supposed to go that way. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of people went back in time to give me those codes of conduct, which is against the point. Once the conversation over is, once the debate is over, it's time for a beer. There's no other conversation. This is our decision. It is a fact, and I have no issues that way. But when I'm sharing, uh, for instance, uh, uh, hey, we have a motion coming in a week and a half. You won't know about it because it won't be recorded. If you want to get involved, reach out. (laughs) So this is before the vote. I think that's where it's got to be open and transparent. If we spent money on something that we didn't know about, I myself didn't know about, council didn't approve, wasn't in the budget, 
I'd like to know how we got to that point. How did this happen? Because frankly, a constituent in, in this specific case, I'm going to keep uh, the, the the subject matter. A constituent brought it to my attention. Was like, well, crap. Actually, I don't know how that happened. Let me let me check. I get a code of conduct because I checked on behalf of a constituent. See, these are the things. Those are the issues when it comes to a vote. And by the way, uh, we had a vote. I wasn't for it at all. Literally, not all, but I stood for the photo because that's our decision. So I'm for that. I'm I'm I'm, I'm for those type of things. You can okay. see the record of my. You can read into it what you want, uh, it, whether. Well, Pat, you're championing this the whole way, or you said no, it was a great idea. Man, I have more information. It's my my thing. No, when I'm talking about transparency, I'm talking about being able to talk to the public about issues and concerns that other constituents have, and versa, vice versa, bringing constituents' concerns to council without fear of reprimand. And that's what Thank I mean by open. No, and I, th I thank you for that for that clarification there, Pat. But you, you said there was three issues that you believe are facing Hanwell right now, in your opinion. So you talked about openness and transparency. What are the two others? So the second one is, uh, and it was the, one of the reasons I ran, was safety for the kids crossing the highway. And uh, for us older people, uh, if you have ever played Frogger, that's what I feel like is happening with our kids. Now, the vote happened. Really? Okay. It feels like it because there's no safe way, there's no crosswalk, there's no sidewalk. There's been a lot of misinformation from within our council, our staff and our council saying that we're not in control of sidewalks. We've been in control of sidewalks since Christ was a corporal, excuse me, using the military uh, 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 lingo there, since, since we were young. So every municipality is really kind of in charge of their own. But there's some tropes and everybody, oh, it's not my job, it's not my job, it's not my responsibility. Well, whose is it? Whose job is it to get the kids there safely? So, and this is wasn't me bringing it back up. It's them bringing it back up to me in December with the code of conduct of a vote that happened in July. Make no mistake, I didn't re bring it back up. I'm only talking about issues they had with me. So we we had the we had the vote. Uh, we're not going to do it in September. We school opened and a parents texting me photos of kids' bikes at the school. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. And uh, the argument, you could hear it in those uh, YouTube videos where everybody's saying the principal doesn't want, doesn't want it, or therefore it's a facto uh, where it gets to. You can hear the mayor say it, the deputy mayor, the CEO stated. So I'm like, wait a minute, the principal's arguing against this. And the theory, the argument at the time was, you know, it may bait them to cross the road, to go on a sidewalk. That was kind of what was explained to me, but he had bike racks there. So moving fast forward i actually had, and i played this uh, to a meeting with the minister of transportation a bunch i heard i saw the video where a kid just one week before got hit by a bike uh by a car uh, on a bike on the handwell on the 640 the one i'm talking about where the school is and you could hear the thunk and i made everybody in that room listen to that thunk because there's nothing more disgusting than hearing a kid get hit by a car and i wouldn't show the video and the reason parents just shared that with me because <laughs> 13-year-olds want to walk to school. Yes, everybody can get bussed between school hours. But we also know school happens outside of school hours. Community happens outside of school hours. The bus is gone by 2.45. Who's taking the kid home at 3.30? Who's after doing soccer and doing stuff like this? So I believe that's going to be uh, another one. And the last one, if I was to pick one, going along that side, I believe our community along the 102, our newly adopted uh, Kings Clear and Island area and uh, where we are here, have an active transportation to get into town. That's uh, that's that, I think that's going to be one of our bigger issues. We all want to do it, but frankly, we're, we're landlocked, so you need a vehicle. But it's not a lot of people. It's just it's too dangerous on the highway to walk. So a, a way to actively treat, get kids, uh, kids, parents, people to get to town. I bet you you'd see one heck of a pile of bikers uh, actively uh, go to town uh, that way. I, I want to pick up on something you talked about around the safety issue, but it's not a not a question about safety. It's about the jurisdictions of government. Um, I, I talk to a lot of municipal politicians from across Canada. Well, that's literally what I do. <laughs> so I can't say I talk to. I literally focus on that. And the one thing I hear, and I want to know if it's the same in Hanwell, do residents understand the different levels of government and what their responsibilities are? <laughs> And I know you joke there, but okay. No, you, you, um, you, you jokingly really. said the roads are provincial matters, schools are provincial matters. Um, but at the end of the day, people will come to you and say, "I have an issue with my edu my school," or "I have an issue with the roads." I have an issue with X, Y, and Z. Do people understand? And I'm not trying to generalize here, but do residents understand what the municipality does compared to what the province does compared to what the federal government does? And how do you, as councillor, 
address the different jurisdictional questions without seeming like you're brushing people off. See, this is where uh, it comes to ownership. Uh, my humble point of view from being uh, in leadership and, and whatnot, and, and I'm not, remember, I'm only a counselor. I'm not the leader of, uh, of the municipality whatsoever. I don't think people in our own council building uh, understand the rules because everybody's, I don't know want to say. Do people want facts. to pass the buck? That's exactly the point. The facts are facts. You can't ignore them. If you want to vote for this because of that, feel free. I will bless you. Uh, I, I've lost votes. Like, eh, all right, fair deal. That's way. But if we're making obscure facts up, facts that aren't true, uh, for instance, no, I do not think the public generally understands everything about it. Uh, I, I, we're not just parks and recreation. That's not what council is. And that's what I feel like some people want this to be. And I understand that's how it started. Uh, but the buck has to stop with somebody. So if I have somebody complain to me about, uh, and I had a uh, person call me up, Pat, uh, the culvert's flooding and this is happening and it, it was DTI issue. They're calling me, they're calling Pat. You know who's responsible? Pat, who's actually have to do the job? Well, hopefully we can build some type of system where we know the chain of command so we can get it to the person who needs it. They shouldn't, I shouldn't have to say, nope, not my job. There's nothing I hate more than those words, not my job, or it's always been this way. Those two things will make me think you're the ignorant person of the life. Uh, and I'm sorry for saying that so bluntly. That's not the case. Um, so it is my job. So when somebody says, and for instance, uh, the, I just went down and tried to figure it out until I got some, somebody showed up to help me to, 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 because you got to be able to do it. I can't fill a pothole, but we certainly can call on their behalf. There was a person up here who had uh, issues with speeding within the community. Of course, it's not really ours because, the, unfortunately for us, and fortunately for us, I don't know how you want to word it, uh, the province actually controls it. It's really literally their job. But if we're not advocating for our constituents, who is? Who's doing it? And that's the point. Uh, it's not about, no, not my job. Call this number. No, I'll call that number for you. Let me see what I can do. And that's the way I look at my role. And I like to see that province will do the same thing to the federal. I know I have a West Wing look of the world. That's how romantically government is supposed to work. Now, I want to. I desperately want to get in a big fight with the province. I do. And I have many reasons I want to get in a fight with the province, but I haven't found an opportunity to get in one yet uh, because I'm, 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 I'm dealing internally to deal with us first. And that's that's where I'm at, if that makes well, sense. Well, I'm pretty sure municipalities across New Brunswick have a few issues with the uh, provincial government, uh, particularly around a certain Bill 45. But that's a issue that we can... We can hash that out at a later date. I want to turn to my last uh, sort of topic, and it's one that is very near and dear to my heart. And as someone who is going to be visiting New Brunswick later on this year, I am looking forward to getting out to Hanwell and visiting some tourist destinations that you're about to describe. So, Pat, what are some of the hidden gems in your community that as a tourist or as Canadians, they need to see if they come to the rural community of Hanwell? Uh, I love how that alliteration doesn't really work. Uh, I know it's a rural. <laughs> um, so first, if you and your husband come down this area, uh, a couple of things I, I'd like to point out. Uh, we have uh, a Kingswood Resort. That's and this is going to be a little bit of me bragging a little bit, but I used to work for them too. I was the IT manager. Uh, we have a golf course that was built there. We built uh, actually one of the first in in, in northern North America that built the irrigation system that was put in the golf course. I was an IT guy, so I got to be out there in my shoes and not be behind a computer. I loved everything about it. So Kingswood Golf Resort, and just to put a little story behind there, uh, when Willie Nelson was coming down, I think uh, back in 2000, uh, I, was, uh, I was the IT manager there at the time. Uh, he went there. We opened the golf car, uh, golf course a little bit early. It's it's a it's a very famous uh, by uh, uh, Huxham. Uh, uh, damn, I forget the, the designer's name. It's been a while. Anyway, so it's really nice. We have a, a whole 14. There's a man-made waterfall. It's just it's just a stunning golf course. Very uh, fun one if you if you enjoy uh, golfing. People come to here for this golf course. There's a hotel. There's an entertainment center. But when Willie Nelson played the golf course, we opened it early. We had to do everything we can to get it open early. It was on the John Stewart show uh, uh, two days later. Anyway, so John Stewart said, hey, so what do you fellas do for fun? He goes, well, I just went golfing. And Willie Nelson voice, I can't do it nor will I pretend to. Uh, we just went golfing at, in Canada, in New Brunswick, at this really nice golf course. Uh, and he goes, wait, you're still touring? He goes, yeah. And, and John Stewart's joke was, well, um, when are you going to retire? He goes, from what, singing and golfing? 
anyway, it's a really great golf course. Uh, he spoke about it because uh, I'm not saying he's endorsing it, but it was really great. It's a great family entertainment center. We also have a lot of glamping areas. We have a lot of trails. We're in nature. Uh, our, our, our motto is inspired by nature, so we try to put trails. We have one of the geocaching, uh, I, I believe, kind of a great geocaching area where people come out and geocache all throughout the area. Uh, we just had another presentation the other day where we're hoping to do a little more with them, uh, with the geocache. I don't know what council's going to do. Make no mistake. I shouldn't have said we. Uh, but but it's a very interesting uh, part. Uh, we've opened up now pickleball. Uh, if you're a balding middle-aged weight man like I am, uh, pickleball is everything. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, we're going to be opening up a couple of areas to do that, as well as we're going to be using, uh, we have an outdoor uh, use agreement with the school that we now just have. Thank God for uh, uh, having a school. School's going to help us build a lot more community than we've ever had before. You know, people follow kids. Uh, it's how it works. Um, and and we have just we have a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of place, a lot of space, but it's it's a lot of trails. What do you do in the community to decompress after a stressful day at work, after a long day at council? Where do you go to decompress? And and I and I hate to say this, but every other counselor I've spoken to this week has all said, um, as of not as of airing, but as of recording this, everyone that I've chatted to said usually I go home and I watch TV. So where do you go in the community to decompress, or do you just go home and put on another episode of The West Wing? <laughs> I still watch episodes of The West Wing uh, religiously. I practically quote shows from you if you wish. Um, so. Yeah, but I think there's something said here. Uh, so I know I act like an extrovert. I do. I act like an extrovert. But my TV room, I literally only had a TV in front of me and nothing, nothing else. Everything else was behind me because I need, I need, I need to shut it down. And that's what I think a, a lot of counselors probably in the same way. They're dealing with the happy smile. You know, I know this is going to sound uh, for for people who aren't elected. Uh, how hard it is to smile. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good joke. I heard that one before. Yeah, that's great. Oh my God, that's that's a great spin on that one. Um, I, I'm not trying to, be, you know, it's, it's you love the engagement and you love being able to talk to people. You love doing that stuff, but being able to shut down, turn it off. That's that's probably why you're having that conversation with a lot of us uh, because we're dealing with these things. We're dealing with the stress. We're reading the reports. We're looking at the numbers. We're seeing the number of accidents. We're talking. Just being able to shut it down is a big deal. But I have to say, having a beer with my neighbors on Friday night, that's kind of how I get through my week. Is uh, And we all go to the garage. It's what we do. We vent about it, everything in the world. We solve all the problems of the world by the end of the night, and we can't remember what we did. So we need somebody to come take minutes uh, as we go forward. Um, my last question for you, and this is the most important one, and you can take as long as you want to answer this. But what makes Hanwell such a unique place to live? to work and to raise a family? Yes, it's you know the stereotypical question, but it's the most important question I think a lot of municipal leaders need to answer. It is, but it starts with how I started. Uh, when somebody described it their way, uh, I just want to go someplace where I can pee off my back deck. You want place, you want space so you can do things. You can, uh, if, if you want to have a barbecue and nobody be in your business, you can. But here's the thing about Hanwell. I used to hate when people said this, bedroom community. I hated that word so much. I hated it because there's no bedroom community out there. Everybody's active in one way or another. It's just people don't know about it. They don't see it. They don't They don't understand what's happening over here, left, right, and center. So that, that phrase used to drive me, and I still use it with care. Um, the difference is we are a bedroom community, but closeted, uh, community-minded. We all want to get out and do stuff. We all want to be part of it. Like you can feel the vibe out here. Uh, I, I was chair of uh, what we called Spook Fest, uh, and, and we, just this Halloween thing. I happen to be a Christmas light and and uh, Halloween enthusiast, so usually it's scary music and lights and everything flashing and just everything. D d more money than brains is all it is. But we applied the same theory to the Spook Fest uh, that was here. I think we had over fifteen to two thousand people show up in a bedroom community that doesn't. People are looking for things and active things to do. So for our community, uh, I think with the school being built, it's going to help focus our community on a place. We have, we now have a recreation center. Remember, they had to find and figure out where to buy a stapler, and now we have a recreation center. Uh, we have a school. We have, uh, you know, so this is going to actually start building it so we can get out of that bedroom stage and just go with that active, let's be more community-minded stage. Why we're uh, uh, really going to be great, first, I can't speak better about the school, its principal, its staff, its teachers. I know these people. They taught my kids. They are incredibly, incredibly caring. 
and uh, uh, community-minded uh, people who are teaching at this school. Um, we also, we, we really do have uh, really great neighbors. Everybody says it. I hope everybody's not lying. I most certainly am not. Uh, we have great neighbors. We have people who just plow people's driveway for random stuff, which snowball on. even so much so that I try to pass it on. So I'm just snowballing people's driveway. I don't know who they are just because that's what's supposed to happen. That's how community is built by getting out and reaching out and then touching somebody. And that's really what this whole community is. It, it really is a genuinely, genuinely uh, uh, closeted bedroom community that can't wait to come together for a barbecue and a picnic. Counselor, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and doing this episode today. Um, I, I say this with respect and I, I say it often, but I, th I, I truly mean it right now. Um, we need more people like yourself at the council tables across Canada. We need people who are willing to engage, people who are willing to speak out, and people who are willing to be open with residents. Because when we get locked in our ways and we become secretive, it doesn't help anyone except the people who are making decisions. So thank you so much for sitting down and doing this today. I appreciate it very much, Chris. And I thank you for the time. This is a great podcast. I've been listening. Uh, I... I think 570 now, 572. I think I'm only on uh, number 25, but I'll get there. Um, but I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode. We will be back tomorrow with another great episode. Until then, just remember, just keep talking.